Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Science Friday live stream. My name is Diana. I am the Experiences Manager for Science Friday, joining you from cold and just recently rainy Brooklyn, New York. It is so nice to see you all, no matter where you are joining us from. I see a few people have actually started to let us know where they are from in the chat. So if you are able to do that, you can um, sign into your YouTube account and let us know where you're from. You can also post questions for the author and contributors that we are going to be um, talking to today on the stream. But um, let us know where you're from. We have people joining from Sacramento, from Philadelphia, Santiago, Chile, Jacksonville Beach, Florida, Indiana, Madison, Madison, Wisconsin so far. Amazing. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm really excited to get to your questions soon. Um, so if you don't know us, Science Friday is your one-stop shop for all things science news. We are well known for our weekly science radio show, which is broadcast every week on, you guessed it, Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can listen to us live on your local radio station or by visiting us at sciencefriday.com and cl clicking the listen banner that's at the top of our page. But today we are here to talk about our Sci-Fi Book Club monthly book pick, which this month for December is The Best American Science and Nature Writing 2023, which is edited by Carl Zimmer and Jamie Green. I'm really excited to have both of the editors here today, as well as two of the contributors for uh, that were featured in this essay collection. Um, I try my best to read this every year, and I know a lot of you do as well. It's a really amazing reminder of the year past, and um, I'm very excited to delve into the ordinary um, and the strange and the amazing parts of our world. Um, and these essays are just to think more deeply about our place and the science happening around us. So um, if you want to join fellow readers to discuss this and other book picks together past today, you can do so on our community site, which is called um, Mighty Networks, we gather there every month. Um, and I will post a link for you to join as well. But you can go to sciencefriday.com slash book club at any time to find out more about how to do that. So a kind reminder to everyone here today, Science Friday is committed to providing a welcoming and harassment-free environment for all mem members of all ethnicities, ages, gender, and trans statuses, sexual orientations, physical abilities, national origin, beliefs, and any other dimension of diversity. We've created a code of conduct, which you can find on our uh, community page if you would like to do so. I'll post another link in the chat later. Um, but that it helps us create a safe and positive community experience for all. And we believe that providing clear expectations is a necessary part of building a respectful community. So here are the basics. Be supportive and respectful when speaking with one another and asking questions in the comments. Share generously and listen closely. You can add thoughts throughout, even if they aren't strictly questions for our guests, although we hope that you have many and we'll post them throughout. We're gonna try our best to stay on topic today. We're here to discuss this month's book club pick, again, which is the best American science and nature writing of 2023 um, and related topics. So we can get a little bit off course, but we're gonna try our best to stay on topic. And we've reserved the right to ban anyone who engages in demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in the chat today. So thanks for sticking with me as I let you know all of those things. Well, that's it. It is time to uh, welcome our amazing guests for today's live stream. So please, without further ado, welcome. We've got Carl Zimmer, Jamie Green, Marion Renault and Marin McKenna, who are joining us here from all over the place. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Hey. Hello. 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 So nice hello. to see you all. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie. I actually, I turned around. Here we go. You're all in the right place now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to introduce you all in turn. So if everyone wants to stick with me for a second, I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of our guests. So first is Carl Zimmer, a columnist for the New York Times and the author of many science books, including Life's Edge, The Search for What It Means to Be Alive, and She Has Her Mother's Laugh. He's also the guest editor of The Best American Science and Nature Writing 2023, and he's based in Connecticut. Jamie Green is a science writer and author of The Possibility of Life, Science, Imagination, and Our Quest for Kinship in the Cosmos, which was also our book club pick for earlier this year. So you can read that book. It's great. She also serves as the series editor for the Best American Science and Nature writing uh, this year and in years past, also based in Connecticut. 
Uh, Marion Renault is a health and science writer based in Grenoble, France. Their essay, A French Village's Radical Vision of a Good Life in, uh, with Alzheimer's, is featured in this year's series. And last but not least, Marin McKenna is a senior writer at Wired, senior fellow at Emory University's Center for the Study of Human Health, and the author of many books, including Big Chicken, Superbug, and Beating Back the Devil. Her featured story, The Provincetown Breakthrough, is also featured in this year's collection. Oh, thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited. Well, Thanks we're for having us. Mm -hmm. Let's just start at the top. Uh, Carl, tell us a little bit about what it is like to be the guest editor for this selection. You talk a little bit in your introduction about the experience of doing that after many years of using this as part of your personal and professional life. So just tell us a little bit about what that's like. Well, yeah, I, I uh, teach um, a, a writing class at Yale where um, over a decade where um, that year's best of science and nature writing is one of the things that I assign. Uh, and it, it, it's always guaranteed to give me a really great uh, range of stories to show students all the different ways that you can write about science and nature, um, uh, different kinds of approaches, um, fresh approaches to very familiar topics or topics that no one ever thought to write about. Um, and so it was, uh, it really felt like um, I could pay back by doing the work this year. So I was really glad to have the opportunity. Of course, it was very uh, daunting because there's just so much uh, to read. I mean, there's so many people are, are just, you know, cranking out stuff at, that uh, is, is really good and really um, addressing a, a lot of the most urgent uh, issues that we face. But Jamie was able to uh, help me, guide me through this. She she has a lot more experience than I do with this series. So she had already been doing a ton of reading by the time uh, the publisher reached out to me. So she showed me stuff that she had been reading. Um, I kind of gathered up things that I had been reading and uh, talk, discussed them, started looking for newer things. And uh, yeah, and then... You know, this wasn't, um, I, you know, I wouldn't say that this is like, you know, it wasn't like we were putting these stories in some hundred meter dash with a, you know, and a timing them or something like that. This was, I was uh, creating, really creating, you know, the kind of book that I would want to teach from this year, um, just representing what in 2023 people are doing, um, you know, and they are writing about, you know, there are certain things that are front and center, like recovering from the pandemic. Um, and also, I guess, you know, another big theme of the book is, you know, the, the tipping points that we're pushing the planet past, whether it's climate change or melting glaciers or other environmental uh, assaults. Uh, and uh, but, you know, there's still room for surprises and for uh, for things that uh, you might not think that anyone would write about. And yet they write about it really well. Did you find that, um, or, or do you think that assigning this book this year will feel different having been the series editor for this year? <laughs> um, I, um, not really, no. I, 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 it's, it's interesting that like there, there is a, when I look back at, at other editions, you know, there is that sort of, I think we're, you know, all the editors have been trying, you know, the challenge has been that science writing, nature writing, is inherently a very broad area. Mm. Uh, and so it's, um, you know, we're, we're trying to like uh, get, you know, get out to the edges of the map, you know, um, because people just write about so many different things, whether it's um, cows <laughs> or, uh, or, or caves or, or uh, Alzheimer's disease or, or being nearsighted. Like there's just a lot of different things that, you, that uh, can be covered. Jamie, as series editor, what is it like working with the guest editors each year? Does it is it a totally different experience? Like, how how do you guide the guest editors and sort of help them with your experience? Yeah, it is it is different every year because so basically, as Carl mentioned, like part of my job is to at the end of the year send the guest editor a big list of pieces that I've read this year that I think are viable candidates. Um, and then what happens after that 
is always different. You know, sometimes there's discussion and back and forth. Sometimes three months later, I get a table of contents and it's all pieces that were from my spreadsheet or almost none, no pieces that were from my spreadsheet. Sometimes we're sort of going back and forth and they're like, oh, I feel like I want to have a piece on this. You know, do you know whose writing should I look at? Like trying to fill the gaps because some guest editors just are like, I want the 20 to 25 best pieces this year. Others are looking for sort of themes or developments or sort of like, you know, gestures that they think were important from there. I mean, I also do that. I remember the year that the big gravitational wave discovery was made, just, you know, saying like, I want to see if I can find anything from there that fits. Um, you know, when there's like a big science story, obviously COVID has been a big one um, over the last few years, but it was also really weird in the 2020 edition that those were all pieces from 2019. It was this very like creepy time capsule of like, as I sort of talk about in my forward of like before capital B. Did you find that this year, it seems like both of you sort of in your, in your forwards and introductions reacted to this, like, this is sort of a, a, a different edition in some ways you could kind of, there were, there was a sense of having a, a good amount of stories about COVID and, and some stories that were not, and it felt right to be able to present a collection. Did you go into that this year, sort of knowing that that would be, or believing that that would be the case, or were you surprised by how like sort of the stack of different stories? Well, I, I mean, you know, a, as a journalist, um, actually, I remember, I don't know if Marin remembers, but uh, I remember emailing her in early 2020 and we were both sort of like, well, here we go. <laughs> Cause we both write a lot about diseases and it's like, here comes a big disease that we kind of knew was coming. And um, you know, I, I'd love to hear Marin uh, talk about her experience. My experience was basically, I just wrote about, I felt like I'm writing about one kind of virus for two or three years or something. I, and just, and just sometimes writing several stories a week. Like I, it, we, we were at the New York times, like the science section suddenly was like, you know, um, just like the breaking news section. Um, and, um, we were working with, you know, the, the political desk, um, and the business desk and having all sorts of collaborations across the newspaper that were really, um, remarkable and, and just, just, going crazy, uh, working as hard as we could on that. And then, you know, there came a point where, you know, I was, things were kind of slowing down a little bit. And, uh, and, you know, I, I don't remember what the first one was, but there came a point where I said to my editor, like, I think I might want to write a story, not about COVID, you know, I don't know, Neanderthals or something like that. But I just, I just sort of felt, I mean, you know, the pandemic was still happening, but I was like, maybe like could i i mean because we were just watching all the science pass us by like you know just so much science was happening even in infectious diseases but we could only write about covid so um yeah so i would say that you know the stories that were coming out in 2022 were uh, uh were uh were kind of a, um they were they were in that sort of in between stage as as you know we're not I'm still writing about COVID and, and other people are, uh, and, but there's time for other things. And those things are important too. Like, you know, our planet's warmer than it's ever been. Like we can't stop writing about that. Um, so yeah, so we're in this sort of uh, intermediate stage and I think the book captures that. Yeah, I think so too. We've got some great questions already from our audience. I'm going to get to those in a few minutes, but um, Mary, and I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your essay that was featured again, titled a French villages, radical vision of a good life with Alzheimer's. It's a very first person personal story that you tell. Did you go into writing this essay knowing that that would be the case or did that sort of slowly unfold and you realize the only way to tell the story is to include my perspective and my family's perspective in this? Um, I, I, from the very beginning, always envisioned this being in first person. And there was a number of things that, that made it so that it, it just felt like the only way to do it, even though typically I, I don't particularly like writing in first person. It's not something that I do a ton of, or I try not to do a ton of. Um, but I felt like because my interest, even in the village itself, was 
born out of the relationship that I had with my grandma, the questions that I was confronting about how I, how my family, how we as a society treat people with dementia, it, it partially just didn't feel honest in a way to not include that in the piece. Like I, I, I was sort of wanting to report it so that I could professionally develop these questions that I had developed through personal experience. So part of it just felt honest. And, and also just like, I don't think I could have been able to write it from a sort of uh, detached third person, curious journalist with, you know, just poking around, asking questions. And then I also felt like what the piece was meant to do or what we wanted to do with the piece um, was talk about and really address the stigma around dementia. And it didn't feel right to not explicitly implicate myself in that stigma because it is part of how I talk to my grandma. It is how my family talks about my grandma. It's about how I think of my myself and the potential for me to have Alzheimer's because I do have two grandparents who had it. And so it, it, it felt uh, not only true, but also a way to face this sort of ugliness of, of what that stigma is about, which can really be boiled down to like we generally, it's it's generally acceptable to say that someone in the late stages of dementia who doesn't know where they are, or who doesn't know who I am or who they are, that they don't deserve certain rights and dignities, and they don't deserve um, certain things like having a home and not just housing, or being treated with uh, as someone who is capable of autonomy, capable of freedom. Um, and I felt like by writing it in, in the first person, I could reach a hand out to the audience, not castigate, but sort of invite them to join me where I was in my processing of, of this subject as a human. Yeah, and I, I hope it, for me, it, it made me think differently about the people in my life who have experienced Alzheimer's or the people in my life who have loved ones who they've had to, you know, um, care for or, you know, um, who have had Alzheimer's and think about those times differently or invite them to read this essay to think differently about their, you know, family's experience. So, um, Jamie, I'd love to ask you too um, about what, what was it about this essay that, you um, helped make it to the collection for you? I mean, it was, you know, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat somewhat, I'm gonna, it answers this question too. How do you define the best? What is the defining criteria? And I will be honest that when I am reading for the anthology, I am not thinking about criteria at all. I am just thinking about the pieces that move me, that engage me. Like I'm reading, you know, hundreds of pieces, sometimes all crammed into the month of December. Um, and so I'm going fast. And these are the pieces that just like make me want to keep reading, that feel important, that feel like I'm learning something. I, the opposite of Marion, I'm very predisposed to first person writing and essay writing. Um, and so I, whenever there's a piece that does something interesting or unexpected with the form of the science magazine feature. I think I'm always a little extra interested. I love those features too. There are always plenty in the anthology, but I'm like, oh, this is this is different. And you can, I think maybe even feel that small danger and excitement of a writer who is not usually being first person vulnerable being first person vulnerable. Um, and then it's also just very interesting science and like so like humanely powerful. And um, yeah, you know, I have grandparents too, or I suppose at this point had past tense. And so it just, you know, there's so much emotional connection and scientific interest. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the pieces that just get you that way. And that, that was one of them. Yeah, Thank this you. was uh, this this is one of those <laughs> ones that um, that also made the rounds in Science Friday's Slack. So um, we all were reading it around the time. So it definitely it definitely stood out to us as well. So I wasn't surprised to see it in the collection. I, I would um, I would just add, I would just add that yeah. um, you know when I when I'm teaching, I find that students a lot of students would like to just uh, insert themselves into their stories, and um, and I just say like you know, uh, do you need to be there? You know, or, or, um, 
you know, just you being you, it's, it's not, you know, that's no offense, but it's not, you, you may not be as interesting as the people you're writing about, at least in this context. Like, you know, I did, I did this, or I sat down at a desk, or like, I don't care. Um, what makes me care? Well, it makes me care, like, if you have to be there in the story. So Marion has to be in her, in that story. Like, just, I can't imagine her not being in it. So there are some pieces in this uh, anthology that are first person, not just Marion's. And you can just take a look and say like, okay, why did that reporter decide that they <clears throat> needed to put that big first person in there? And why was it that people left themselves out of other ones? Um, and that's a good way to just to, to kind of get to appreciate the decisions that science writers make. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marin, I also want to talk a little bit about your essay, Provincetown Breakthrough. Um, I, when I, I, when I started reading this essay again, um, I had, I had a little bit of trepidation because I was like, Oof, okay, I'm getting into one of the COVID uh, stories that we're going to be telling. And I, and I got to the end and I, I'll admit that I welled up a little bit because it was just such a, like, a hopeful story about what's possible if we come together in community around these these difficult times and if we choose to create systems that can help in, in sort of these like, you know, catastrophic moments. Um, I also had forgotten that this happened. And so like, I, I feel like a lot of like a lot of people, these these <clears throat> essays are a reminder of some of the moments that were maybe only two years ago that we're sort of reflecting back on that since have felt like ancient history or that we're like, oh yeah, I, I kind of didn't remember that. Um, I, I wanna ask you a little bit about what it was like to write this essay in, in addition to sort of like, you had mentioned in our pre-interview that these stories are, uh, you know, work of collectiveness of, of like the story that you told about um, this outbreak that happened in Provincetown and the community that came together to sort of like, take care of each other. Um, science writing is is also a collective effort that there are people beyond the byline that make these things happen. So I just want to give you a little space to talk about the story and the people who helped make it happen. Okay. <clears throat> I'll try to keep all of those in mind. Thank I you. I know that was a lot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of a pre-brief, but, but so first, thank you for having me. And thank you, Carl and Jamie for selecting me. Um, so Carl, in his description of how he approached reviewing stories for this edition really teed this up for me nicely because this story was published 18 months ago, the middle of 2022, when that door was starting to open and but both as, as, a, um, as a profession of science writers and also broadly as a culture, we were really starting to turn away from COVID and actively like not wanna hear about it anymore. And, and the moment it describes, which is a, just about a year before that, is the moment when everything started to go wrong. So just to remind you a bit of the history, you know, COVID arrives somewhere around the turn of, of 2019 to, to 2020, maybe a bit a month or so before that in Asia, it pretty much gets to the United States in March of 2020 and everything goes to hell. We get the vaccines in the middle of December, 2020, uh, an extraordinary effort. You know, there has never been a vaccine that came to, to, to market that fast. And by the early summer of 2021, people were starting to feel like we were going to come out of it. Um, large numbers of people had been vaccinated just before the episode that's described in this story, both the CDC and then the White House had told people that they could take their masks off. People were starting to come out into public again. That's what was happening in Provincetown, which is sort of the, the capital for, for most of the country, or at least for the East Coast of, of LGBTQ America. People were coming back to all the big street festivals and parties and clubs and so forth that had existed before the pandemic and then had been chilled for a couple of years. And then people started to get sick and they got sick because the new variant, the Delta variant was arriving and that had not been predicted and the vaccine was not tuned up to prevent it. So first that showed us that the vaccines were not going to be perfect and that we were going to be in a race to always keep up with this virus. But also public health said, you know, it would be a good idea to start putting masks back on. And that's really the start 
of the mask wars, of the attacks on public health, of the attacks on school boards that, that have morphed into sort of more general attacks on schools. I really think that the all the so many, not all, but so many of the negative things that we remember about the COVID experience, which people think is over, it's not over, mm -hmm. stem from that summer. And what was extraordinary to me looking at that moment and hearing about how the mostly men who were in Provincetown in those couple of weeks decided to organize both themselves who were in Provincetown and their extended networks to get tested, to alert each other, to alert um, the rest of the country, to engage with public health um, proactively, to reach out and say, we got tested, we've done our own epidemiology, we can help you with this. They were voluntarily taking on themselves the kind of stigma that for the first six months of 2021 had largely been directed at the Asian community as having somehow imported COVID. Now the, they were in, almost inviting people by, by taking responsibility for, the, for, be, for pushing back against the virus. They were laying themselves open to being stigmatized as the people who brought Delta to the United States. So when we started thinking to, to transition to the second part of your question, um, when we started thinking about doing this story and the story really originates with my then features editor, Adam Rogers, who'd been at Wired for a long time, he's now at Insider. And then Adam very kindly passed the story on to Anthony Lydgate, who was the features editor who took it forward from there under the aegis of Gideon Litchfield, who was at the time the first queer editor in chief of Wired and really blessed the story. What we wanted to do was uh, oh, start watching this episode almost from the start, was to debunk that stigma and that, that sense of responsibility being pinned on the, the gay and queer community and say, no, you have got this backwards. It's not that they caused this, it's that they prevented this. They prevented it from getting worse. So in addition to, um, uh, to, to being a, a debunk, um, it's kind of a love letter for me, to a, a community that chose to do the right thing, knowing that they were going to suffer in the public sphere from doing that. And we had to wait some months to actually conclude the story. The last section of the story, which is about scientists at the Broad Institute tracking down the genetics of the virus and proving that even though Delta overwhelmed the country and Omicron after it, the particular strain of Provincetown actually vanishes. And it vanishes because of the work that, that the, the gay and queer networks did. Um, we, we had to wait for that, that last part of the story, which arrives in the spring of 2022, to, to tell the whole thing. But by the end, what we had, I think, was something that set the record straight and, and gave people praise for things that they were being blamed for. And that felt really good. Yeah, it felt really good to read as well. Even if in the back of my mind, I was like, I wish like this story could like completely supersede the story that we had been told. But th that is that is what good science writing does, right? It tries its best. And it, it when there's a story to sort of retell in the future, we, we try our best to. And so... Um, so I just have to say thank you for saying that you welled up at the end and particularly at the last line. Um, so I was uh, an English major and French major, and the last line is a free adaptation of a line from um, from Camus' The Plague, um, in which he says, um, the, the main character says, uh, there are there are plagues, I'll do it in English because that's how it is in my story, there are plagues and victims in the world, and we all of us can decide at any moment not to be on the side of the plagues. I saw everyone reach for their copy to read it <laughs> along. Um, and um, I just want to say, uh, it is amazing the things that science and arts can do together. Um, that is a perfect example of how, <laughs> if you think you know Camus plays and that won't possibly come into a work uh, that you have in the science field, think again, because um, Marin just proved you wrong. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, we've got some great questions from the chat. And so I'm going to sort of delve into them right now. Um, one from Roberta, which reads, how do you decide how much scientific detail to put in to still be informative to your essays, but not lose your reader in the weeds? I'm going to actually sort of like, I know Carl and Jamie, uh, you don't have essays, of course, featured in this series, but you are science writers. I'd love to hear your perspective on this too. But um, uh, Jamie, I'll start with you. What, what do you... How, how do you sort of like bridge this gap? This is a calibration that often happens in conjunction with my editor. Mm. Um, you know, I do my best. I, I, but I also, and I have a lot of trouble, especially when I'm writing about a topic that I've been writing about for a while or have been studying for a while or I'm interested in. I mean, studying as a lay person, I do not have a PhD. Um, I often have trouble maintaining a sense of what a random reader already knows. You know, like when I'm writing about exoplanets, it's like, does the general reader know that, th that we have found planets around other stars? Does the general reader know that we have not found life on any of them? Like, I don't know. Um, and so working with an editor, and I'm very lucky that the last few editors I've worked with on science pieces were not specialists in my zone of science. Um, so there's often them asking for more explanation. So it's less for me about getting too in the weeds and more realizing when am I in the weeds and when do I need to show the reader the path <laughs> deep into the weeds? Um, whatever's deep in the weeds is usually what's very interesting to me. So it's more about how do we get them into the weeds so that when they are there to really overextend the metaphor, they don't feel lost and disoriented. Um, because I think if we stay outside of the weeds, then we're not going to get, it's not as interesting. It's not as exciting. My favorite science writing by other writers is the stuff that gets us really deep in the weeds and feels good while we're going there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love an extended I, metaphor. I'm here for it. I, I guess I would, I, I would add that, like, for me, I have to remind myself the weeds are not actually the destination. Like, we're not actually trying. You know, it's not like, oh, we're going to get into the weeds. It's like, no, we're actually in the weeds for a reason. We're, we're actually going somewhere else. And um, yeah, I, editors really can help. My, my editor, uh, current editor at the Times, Virginia Hughes, she will sometimes be like, "Do I really need to know this?" And I'll look at a paragraph and be like, no, in fact, you don't. <laughs> like, uh, there's like, I can get through this much faster and there's nothing lost by just leaving out this like particularly convoluted piece of statistics. Like, I know how that works and I know that these conclusions are sound because of that, but I don't need to walk people through. Like, we're not, we're writing stories and, and articles and essays. We're not writing scientific papers. So we need to sort of keep that stuff to a minimum. But but as Jamie says, like, you know, there, you know, you, you want to learn how these things are done, you know, how, you know, when Marin is showing how epidemiology is carried out, like, how does that work? Um, and you learn when you read her piece. Amazing. Um, Marian, what do you think? How, how do you sort of bridge this sort of fine balance here? I think there's some reporting that's for the reporter, ultimately, and then there's the reporting that's actually for the end of the piece. And when I was an undergrad, one of my first journalism classes, our, our professor was big on, like, report this much, like, say this much. And so I try to sort of, as the, usually as a draft is going through edits, because I agree with everyone so far that it's especially helpful when you finally have a second person in in the room, on the page, uh, you have to look at everything you put in and explain why that's there or understand why it's there. And oftentimes I find that if there's a bunch of details all clus clustered together and an editor points to it, usually all of that can just be one really good sentence. And it doesn't make any of the details that get sort of pruned away less important, um, but there's sort of, you, you need to be bloated, for, or at least I feel like I need to be bloated first. Like I need to be sort of, like the a wet stopping sponge. And then after the editing, like everything becomes more crystalline, everything becomes more precise because over time you just, you see and you hear what the person doesn't need to know. I think that's kind of what everyone's describing. Like you, you sort of, 
when something wiggles in the draft, it's wiggling for a reason and you and you sort of know to pay attention and fix it. So I I try to get completely imbibed and then trust that the editing process will turn that into what it needs to be, which will inevitably mean most of it is not going to be on the page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love all of the metaphors so far. We've got wiggling words. We've got um, weeds. We've got sopping wet sponges. Um, I'm here for it. Marin, do you have anything else you want to add? Well, I really enjoyed what Carl was saying, because like Carl, I, I teach science writing to undergraduates. Uh, and my undergraduates are primarily people who are in science and health majors. I think Carl's are too. And uh, this is a, a ferocious battle for them. And it, it has uh, <laughs> reminded me about sort of the battle that I take for granted in doing this myself, which is that it, it's an ego struggle, right? You, you want to look like you know this stuff. You want to look smart. I mean, you want you want to sound smart when you're talking to the scientists you you're talking to, but you also want to look smart in front of the reader. And we have this temptation to deploy complicated jargon as a way of signaling that we know what we're talking about and and remembering to always foreground the reader and the mm -hmm. reader's experience that it's not really about us that it is actually about how the reader is going to receive this is a constant struggle i would just add that i i find that usually when i have jargon if some if my editor asks me, well, what does this mean? It's usually the opposite where I realize that I actually don't really mm -hmm. grasp mm -hmm. what is being expressed. And I feel like jargon might feel sort of like an armor, but I I always feel like underneath it, if you're using jargon, it's because you haven't found the simpler, clear way to say what that is really what that jargon is really saying in language terms. Um, what did you mean by this is probably the thing I ask my students most. <laughs> Carl, do you hear yourself saying that a lot as well in your class? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and it's um, and it's you know, it's not fun when you know you're a student and the teacher says, "Well, what do you mean by this?" And you're like, "I, I don't actually know." Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like it's it's good to like have that little revelation, and then you go and you rewrite and you come back, and it's it's always much better. Yeah, I uh, I find that that happens a lot in my scripting as well. When I'm like, I don't need to say this. So it, it's a good skill to have is just like asking yourself what's important uh, for all kinds of writing. Um, wow, more great questions as from our uh, audience. We've got one here, which reads, do you consider writing style and accessibility or purely the scientific merit of an article and making selections? Jamie and Carl, this one looks like it's for you. Um, Carl, what do you think? Is that, is writing style on your mind? Is it just like the science story that's being told? It's, it's both. I'm, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can be writing about a scientifically important story, but you know, I mean, if it's f full of cliches, if it's dry, like I, I, don't, I probably don't feel like reading it. So I wouldn't want to inflict it on readers of this book. Um, uh, you know, and uh, it's great when people find a, uh, a, a an important subject and 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 bring a style to it um, a, that you know it almost surprises you. Um, uh, Maggie Kurth uh, has a piece in um, in uh, in the article called "The Butterfly Effect," um, which is about extinction, about species disappearing. And focusing on one butterfly and how it, it kind of almost depends on us now for its survival. It's very funny and quirky, and she cracks jokes. And you, you know, you start thinking like, "What is that appropriate?" Like, but actually, yeah, it works. It's sort of this. I don't know if you call it gallows humor or something, but it really works. She's got she's got her own style and her own voice, and uh, that was what drew me to that. Um, at the other end of the spectrum of something is just all style and, you know, there, and it's sort of puffing up a, a story that really is not that important. Um, uh, I, th that, that I would not uh, pick for a, a series like this either. Jamie, anything to add? Yeah, I think for me, because I'm not making the final decisions, I'm like finding, you know, a bunch of candidates. Um, 
writing style and sort of the quality and wonderfulness of the prose is an absolute requirement for me. Um, it's also the thing that I am more capable of judging. You know, if I'm reading an article about a physics breakthrough, I'm going to have to trust the writer on that one. You know, like I don't, I don't know. Um, there, so, so I'm more focused on looking for great writing about science and nature. Um, but if a story is interest, if the subject matter is interesting, is surprising, is exciting, is important, that contributes to that the sense of the piece's power. Um, but you know, I'm thinking one of my one of the most memorable pieces from. So this is my fifth anthology that I've been series editor for. One of the pieces that I think about the most often was from the 2019 book, which was the first one that I um, worked on. It was about paper jams. It's called Why Paper Jams Persist. And it was fascinating. And that, I mean, so that's not, if we talk about scientific merit also, like, what does that mean? Are you talking about validity, um, correctness, or importance, you know, what is the most meaningful science or technology? It's not paper jams, but it was just so interesting. And I'm still, anytime someone's on Facebook complaining about their printer, first I recommend the printer I have, which is like the, the Brother Black and White, which works great, but then I send them this link because it is just like, why are there still paper jams? It's just, ah, I still get so excited about this piece about paper jams. So um, I think that obviously shows that my answer is slightly more about writing style and storytelling, but um, the science does need to, at least by my smell test, seem valid as well. Yeah, I would imagine so. A few people had questions about like fact checking the stories as well. I mean, all of these stories, because they are published in these like reputable uh, spaces in advance, I'm sure they also get fact checked, you know, before they are published. Jamie I mean, I would, no, yeah, no, I would guess that, um, I mean, it depends on the publications, but I would guess it comes down to maybe a quarter of them. Half of them have been fact checked. Fact checking is sad. I mean, Baron, I, I haven't looked at like, which publications, but we have literary journals in here. They're not fact checking. Mm. Um, I know some, you know, website magazines are not fact checking. So fact checking is not a default and we are not able to re fact check the stories. You know, we copy edit looking for mistakes. Um, but for the most part, the stories are printed as they were printed in their original publications. But, um, you know, I saw someone mentioning like books as well, just in case anyone is not aware of this, nonfiction books are not by default fact checked either. Publications copy edit, they or publishers copy edit, they do not fact check. If a book is fact checked, the author has either paid for it themselves or somehow gotten additional funding for that. So yep. are we raising hands because we got additional funding to fact check our books? Yes. Well, because I paid for it myself. <laughs> Right, right. I got a grant to do it because my advance would not have quite covered it. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. Um, it's tricky, is what I will say. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of tricky, um, Marion, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience as a freelance science writer. That's probably very different from people who have been or, or you know, want to be at some point um, a staff writer. Can you talk a little bit about sort of like the pros and cons of that experience? Yeah. Um, yes. Where to start? Uh, well, I know, I know Marin, you've done both too, right? You've been, yeah. But, um, so I think that there's quite a few negative, there's a lot, quite a few drawbacks to being a freelancer. And, um, I think that, uh, if you've ever talked to a freelance journalist, they probably told you all of these things, but, um, the money problems are real, um, and it's not just low pay, even though I will recommend that the uh, Freelance Solidarity Project does have a rate sharing um, effort or website where people can share and look at rates, but it's not just sort of pay transparency. It's not just um, that, that we're paid at the end of the completion of a project, so when it's published. So like a piece like this one that takes many months to work on that usually means working for free until it's finally published and then you get paid all at once which is 
not a super, at least for me, not a super healthy way to sort of uh, live financially. Uh, mentally, that's very difficult. Um, but then there's also um, like just administrative stuff that you have to do as a freelancer that can be really burdensome. Uh, putting aside money for retirement, dealing with figuring out insurance, reading contracts. Um, and the last thing I'll say on the bad side is it can be super, super solitary and super lonely because um, when you're a staffer, you have coworkers, you have a regular boss or bosses, people with whom you have daily interactions. And for the most part, that's not really the same thing in, in as a freelancer, but there is so much independence um, and there's so much, I think, privilege to that independence, right? I, I get to sort of decide on, on story ideas that I would like to do and then I shop them around, right? I don't have one person who sort of says yes or no. So when you're a freelancer and you have something you really wanna do, you can pursue that. And that's this kind of creative expression, a creative freedom um, that I didn't necessarily feel last time I was at a staff uh, position, although that was at a newspaper, so it's a whole different kind of can of worms. Um, and then to sort of uh, relate to what we talked about earlier, uh, I think that something that's really great about freelancing is that you also have this lateral space to try different formats, right? Not every publication is going to want you to use first person ever. Um, not every publication is going to want certain story structures or certain lengths, uh, whether that's really short or really long. Or um, There's a ton of freedom and a ton of creativity that, that I think is really important to note. I'm always really happy to see that in the collections, there's a mix of both because I think that there is something to be said about staffers who can chip away at stories, who have resources behind them, who can put in time and, and work beats and develop relationships. Uh, and then there's also something that, um, there's something about the way freelancers are doing journalism, but then also sort of like right against, working really right in the face of like, what is labor? What is our labor? What is our profession? What is it worth? What is our value? And how much are we willing to, you know, at what what price can we put on that labor and and how can we um yeah so a, a, a little bit of around but i i think that even when you look at a, a collection like this you can see how the way that someone's work is funded and the way that it's structured and organized can be a real advantage or bring very particular assets to the final pieces i endorse everything marion said mm -hmm. <laughs> I imagine probably a lot of people feel that way as well. It's like it's a it's a push and pull and and the ways that it will get better is with better systems for the people who are doing this really hard and important work. So um, you're all science writers. Thank you all so much for doing this. Um, somehow we're like running out of time. I don't know how 50 minutes have already <laughs> passed by. I have one more question from the audience I want to ask you and then we're going to wrap up. Um, Titus says, I'm a freshwater ecologist and I don't see much freshwater science reaching these types of volumes. How can we get more people excited about their backyards? I, I'm going to kind of expand that out and say, like, how would you recommend people get excited about blank? Like, Carl, if someone says, I want to get people excited about um, these tiny millipedes that no one knows about, about their backyards, about the science of um, cutting incredibly small microbes. How, what kind of advice do you have for people who want to get people excited about a thing they're really excited about? I, I sometimes <clears throat> get into these uh, conversations, sometimes like in workshops with science graduate students. Um, and basically I say like, well, I know it excites you. Um, I mean, I mean, well, here we have a freshwater ecologist. Like, obviously he's really excited about freshwater ecology. Otherwise he would not have gone to grad school and like worked crazy hours to get a PhD in freshwater ecology. And then say, actually, I want a whole job in freshwater ecology. So what is it? What is it about that freshwater ecology? What is it about those little worms that somebody uh, is excited about that excites them? Um, and it may sound weird. Sometimes it sounds inappropriate to uh, talk about uh, science in terms of emotions. You know, science is not supposed to be emotional. It's supposed to be like, here's the data and, and you should just be want to read this because it's data. Um, but that's not really how science works. Um, that's not how anything works. Um, we're people and we do things and we're motivated to do things. Um, and um, so um, 
you know, so, so, you know, sometimes somebody will, I'll say just as a grad student, like, well, tell me what you do. And at first they'll just give me a very cold clinical description of like, well, I study these group of cells and I'd be like, um, okay, like, um, are those cells cool? And be like, oh my God, they're so cool. And then like all of a sudden, like they've sort of been given permission to tell you what uh, makes them passionate about it. And so I think that, you know, people who, uh, particularly scientists who, who want, you know, scientists are welcome to write in the first person and tell us about these things. Um, they need to tap into that and let that, uh, and, and so that we can share that. I mean, because a lot of what write, all writing in is, is communication where, you know, two people's minds are being brought together. Um, and part of that is sharing a state of mind, an emotional state of mind. Um, and so you need to be aware of that um, and not just be such a scientist. Jamie, anything to add? I mean, this is, so it's, it's, you know, when you say, how can we get more people excited about their backyards? I'm wondering, like, are those people the readers or is the problem about reaching the writers, you know? And as for how writers find what they're interested in, and apologies if anyone can hear my dog barking in the other room. He knows that my son is about to get home from school and he's really excited. Um, you know, I think about how I got interested in what I, like, there are science writers who are interested in everything. And so that makes me wonder, like, what are the stories in freshwater ecology? What are the exciting discoveries? What is the motivation for wanting to share these stories? You know, like, is it um, scientifically important? Is there a cool narrative? Is it just some fabulous cool thing where you want a writer to show it to the audience and say like, look how cool this is, which is honestly like how I do most of my writing. Um, because this is, this is another thing that like, cause I, I also teach and I think about like, what is the reason for being for this piece, you know? And so like, why should people be excited about their backyards? Um, is it the sort of like romance of, oh, there's all this amazing science right here, or is it, you know, what are the stakes to not understanding the science? Um, so that's something to think about. But then like, there's sort of logistically a few steps in between the scientist and the reader. You know, there's the writer, there's the publication, there might be a publicist or a press officer at the institution. So as for like, how that all happens, that I don't know. Um. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of people along the way. Go ahead, Marian. If I if I can just add something, I think there's also something specific about water and water that is not mm. the ocean. And and I don't mean that like freshwater and 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 salt water. I just mean I, I think that readers and journalists, I think conceptually, where water comes from, what that actually means, what the actual answer is, and also aquifers, I mean, asking a person to understand. It, 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 there's something specific about water that I think is just genuinely difficult to write about. It, 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 yeah, and so I feel like uh, this person has put their finger on something that's very real is that there are some subjects that are fascinating when you look at the science and you learn what's living in them or how they work or how the systems work. But I do think that it's like sort of a slippery kind of subject for some reason. Um, Nice. Slippery. I don't know if you did it on purpose, but no, I didn't. <laughs> Marin, what about you? Anything else you want to add? Is this where I get to get personal? <laughs> Always. Is this our like you know, what happens next kind of question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I was so thrilled to join this conversation because um Journalism is a very evanescent and fragile profession right now. <coughs> Excuse me. And almost all of the people that I mentioned who were responsible for this story coming to be, my, my features editor, my other features editor, my editor-in-chief, the fact checker, um, at least one of the layout people, almost all of those people have left Wired in, in the two years since we conceived the story. So I particularly wanted to be able to sort of thank them in public for this, this story that now is going to have a life beyond the magazine and beyond the website in this book. So thank you, um, 
Jamie and Carl for that. And and um, thanks, Marion, for um, for for giving a glimpse into the freelancer's life because I am about to come join you. Today is my last day at Wired. I was laid off. <laughs> so I am joining all the other people who worked on this story in being beyond the magazine and um, doing something different in journalism. So thanks for letting the story have a sort of second brief glimpse in the sun. Yeah, I mean, I have been thinking as I'm reading now for next year, how many people I whose work I'm reading have been laid off how many publications I'm reading have ceased publication in the last year. Uh, you know, I'm reading pieces from National Geographic and Popular Science, and it is... Uh, R.I.P. to both of those. Yeah, so it, is, it is essays from Catapult, you know, like where Sabrina Imbler's book started. Catapult isn't publishing essays anymore. Like the, the landscape for science journalism, it's the landscape for all journalism, but I think it's been real bad news um, for science journalism lately. It, um, I'm really glad that we are able to immortalize pieces in this book because, you know, print, who knows, and website, it's, I'm really sorry, Marin. it sucks. And Thank you. It's, <laughs> Thank uh, you for the book. <laughs> Thank glad. you so much. I'm glad we could do that. And thank you for being so honest and open with us, Marin. I know that um, there are people in the chat also who are staying their condolences. And you're right. This is um, the it's it's never been more important to have amazing and um, well-rounded and diverse science journalism and journalists in the field. And um, I really appreciate all of you for all of the really hard work that you did making these essays and this collection happen. So unfortunately, that is the end of our time together. So I just want to thank you all so much for doing this. Um, I'm going to give you all a chance to, to let us know if people want to find out more about you, where they can do that. So I'm sure people are um, really excited about your work and excited to find more. So Carl, why don't you start us off? Where can people find more about the work that you do? Um, my website is carlzimmer.com. So that's the Love place. It. Jamie, what about you? Yeah, I'm uh, jamiegreen.net, and that is also where you can find information about submitting or nominating work for next year's edition or future editions. Most of my reading is from writer and editor submitted pieces. Anyone could submit their own work. The you know um, eligibility requirements are on the website, um, and there's and all all my stuff is on there too. Amazing. Thanks, Jamie. Marion, where can people find out more about your work? MarianRenault.com. Love it. <laughs> First name, last name. <laughs> um, Marin, what about you? Uh, well, I'm MarinMcKenna.com. My site is a little out of date, but I'll be updating that soon. <laughs> In the <laughs> yeah. my my tag, my social tag is is on the screen, Marin MCK, and it is the same on all platforms: Twitter, X, Blue Sky Threads, Instagram. Um, probably on Mastodon. I haven't been there in a while. Anywhere where there's a platform, that would be me. Amazing. Thank you all so much. This collection is such a, it's such a lovely way to round out this year and a way to look back at the last few years and really see some of the amazing stuff that is happening in science journalism. So thank you all so much. If you want to find out more about the Science Friday Book Club, sciencefriday.com slash book club is the place to go. Um, we're going to be reading next. So we're only about halfway through this collection so far. So there's still more than enough time to catch up and to read the essays that we're going to be reading in the next few uh, weeks. But next month, we are also reading Ed Young's An Immense World, which I'm very excited about and is a, a great, another great example of amazing science writing. So I hope you will join us then. Thank you to all of our guests. Um, it was so great to have you. And thank you to our audience for your amazing questions. I appreciate them so much. And we'll see you all next time. Have a great, have a great day, everybody. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye.